the first item of business is portfolio questions and I will try to get as many people and of course supplementaries in as possible. Uh, the first portfolio is environment, climate change and land reform and question number one, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government how many community right to buy applications have been received in the last 24 months and what proportion have been approved? Rosanna Cunningham. Since April 2016, the Scottish Government has received a total of 35 applications from 19 different community groups. Uh, this is consistent with the number of applications in total since the Act was first passed. 17 of the 35 applications have been approved from 12 out of the 19 groups, and there are currently three applications still under consideration. Finlay Carson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Kirkmaiden Community Harbour Trust has the right to buy Dromore uh, Harbour accepted by the Scottish Government, but the Trust have been waiting over a year to hear a final decision from the QLTR to take over the running of the harbour. Although I understand completely that due diligence needs to be carried out, waiting over 12 months is completely unacceptable. Will the Cabinet Secretary personally intervene in this case to ensure that the Trust can take over the running of the harbour without further delays? Rosanna Cunningham. Um, I, I would be, um, it would be helpful, I think, if the member was to write to me with more specific detail on that particular application. Um, if the application has been agreed by me, I would have expected it uh, and hoped that it would have been expedited uh, rather sooner than, than this. Um, but the member uh, will uh, understand that without knowing something more of the detail behind that, it's a little difficult for me to comment. Supplementary, Bruce Crawford. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me what steps the Scottish Government is taking to increase awareness and uptake of community right to buy, particularly in urban areas? And can she give examples of projects which could provide inspiration to other community groups? I know I have one, certainly in my own constituency, of Stirling, of the remarkable project to refurbish Bannockburn House, I think is a fantastic example. But any other examples the Cabinet Secretary could provide would be very useful. Rosanna uh, I have, in fact, myself visited uh, Bannockburn House and I can see the uh, tremendously good work that is being done there. Um, as with all projects like this, it will be um, a long uh, process. Um, I would advise uh, the member that uh, uh, if people are looking for really good examples of urban right to buy, then I would direct them to Action Porty, which was the very first urban community right to buy application um, they successfully completed the purchase of a church in Belfie, uh, Belfield Street in Portobello uh, at the end of 2017. They have tremendous plans um, and uh, uh, I know that they have every intention uh, of that coming to fruition. Um, there is a growing interest from urban communities, uh, presiding officer, in the right to buy uh, um, provisions. Um, and we do as much as we can to encourage urban communities to think uh, about making uh, those right to buy applications. Um, uh, for those who are interested, Community Land Scotland last month published a report on community ownership in urban areas and it provides an overview of cur uh, current urban community ownership. It's available on Community Land Scotland website for those who are interested. Question number two, Richard Lyle. Good morning, officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to improve the provision and variety of locations of charging points for electric vehicles. Hamza Youssef. As announced in the programme for government, we're rapidly increasing our efforts to support electrical, electric vehicles, ensuring that by 2032 we will have uh, ended the need, have phased out the need to buy petrol or diesel cars and vans. We continue to work with Scottish local authorities and partners to increase the provision of charging points right across uh, both urban and rural Scotland. This includes homes, workplaces, public and private car parks, housing estates and on-street charging points. Uh, details of our plans will be announced in the coming months. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? Can I raise with the Minister an issue faced with a constituent who, who wished to use the, the government's generous scheme for the installation of a charging point, but again was denied permission by his housing association does the Minister agree with me that we should be encouraging this rather than discouraging it? And could I invite the Minister to have further discussions with the Housing Minister to encourage developers in the future to consider the inclusion of charging points in their housing plans? Hamza Youssef. I say I've already had a conversation with the Housing Minister on this uh, issue and he's very much 
uh, of course, in alignment uh, with our own uh, vision uh, on this. I, I know the case because the members mentioned it to me uh, and raised it uh, previously. So my officials have been liaising with the relevant housing association to ensure that a solution can be found. I'm pleased to say that following these discussions, the housing associa association concerned is currently now going uh, is currently applying for a grant to install electric vehicle charging to allow residents to make the switch to an electric vehicle. I'm keen to see uh, the update of electric vehicles, uh, the uptake uh, of electric vehicles across Scotland. Officials will follow up with that specific housing association, but perhaps in the back of that, they should get in touch with the umbrella bodies uh, for housing associations right across Scotland to remind them of the generous government schemes that exist, uh, so that of course more people can uh, take up uh, electric vehicles. If we can have quick answers to the supplementaries, I'll be able to get them all in. Uh, so supplementary to Liam McCarthy. Thank you very much. Um, in extending the network of charging points, the Minister will be aware of the importance of uh, ensuring that maintenance uh, takes place so that the public can have confidence in the reliability. Can the Minister update Parliament on the steps being taken to improve maintenance uh, and to ensure that where there are faults, there's an automatic default to free vend at these charging points? Hamza Yusuf. Uh, to be brief, I know the Member's uh, interest in this, and Orkney, of course, leads the way when it comes to electric vehicles uh, per head uh, of the population. Uh, the reliability of charge points is something that Lee MacArthur uh, has raised with me. Uh, I'll be perhaps offline, I'll give him uh, more of an update in a bit more detail, but his suggestion of the automatic set to default, I think, is one that's definitely worthy of consideration, one we're considering uh, fully. Supplementary, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have a request from one of my GPs to have a charging point installed at his practice. Does the Minister agree that if charging points are installed in health centres, at council buildings and the like, it will encourage more people to switch to hybrid or electric powered cars? And what more can be done by the Scottish Government to enable smooth and swift installation of charging points at such locations? Hamza Yusuf. The first thing in, in, in Scotland, we have a good network, as was alluded to in the previous question of, of charge points across Scotland, around about 800 of which, again, approximately 175 are rapid chargers. And the distance between charging points is very good too. And they average about 2.7 miles in Scotland compared to uh, four miles uh, in the rest of the UK. But where it does make sense to install chargers, for example, at hospitals, GPs clinics, then of course our generous scheme should allow that to happen. Uh, I will update Parliament in due course in the coming months uh, on our plans, on our milestones to get us uh, to, to, to ensure uh, increased uptake of electric vehicles. Uh, as part of that, of course, I'll consider the suggestions the member makes. Daniel Johnson. Thank you. Um, the government's targets are undoubtedly ambitious, ranked fifth in the world according to WWF. However, it's clear we need to step up our activity in the rollout of charging points. So what consideration is the Scottish Government giving to changing building standards to require all new build houses to include a charging point? I should say that some uh, developers have already chosen to take that step voluntarily. I think it's uh, very, very positive to see that they're building houses with the right cabling infrastructure to allow for charge uh, points as part of the conversation I'm having uh, with the Housing Minister. And I'll allow him, uh, of course, to keep you updated on that. But I think the member is absolutely right that there has to be a real step change in, uh, of course, our actions in relation to, 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 to this. Uh, we have, as I say, the comprehensive network of charging points, but frankly, that is going to have to be expanded rapidly uh, in the coming few years. But his idea around uh, using uh, building regulations, uh, planning, uh, all of these are things that are being considered. And of course, as I say, when we're ready to update him and update Parliament, uh, I'll make sure he knows. A quick supplementary and answer from John Scott, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And will the mandatory introduction or inclusion of electric charging points for new housing developments, particularly uh, affordable housing be introduced in new planning legislation. Is that Hamza Yusuf. Uh, again, that would be one for the Minister responsible for, for planning. All I can say at this stage is that those conversations have taken place uh, within government. Of course, Kevin Stewart will know more about the legals and the uh, ins and outs. But as I've just said to Daniel uh, Johnson, when we're ready to update Parliament, we will, of course, do that at the earliest opportunity. Question number three was not lodged. Question number four was not lodged. Question five, Annie Wells. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress with developing the Glasgow Low Emission Zone. I'm sorry, Yusuf. Glasgow City Council published an update report on the 20th of March in relation to progress with developing the Glasgow Low Emission Zone, with a further update expected to be published in June. Annie Wells. I thank the Minister for that answer. A report by the World Health Organisation last year found that Glasgow was one of the most polluted areas in the UK with poorer air quality than London. And I'm pleased to hear that the low, emission, the low emission zone will be implemented by the end of the year. 
for Tritlow now that has been described as a health emergency. Can the Minister give assurances that the Scottish Government will work with the Council to make sure that businesses in the city are not adversely affected and we do also finally see pollution levels drop? Hamza, you said. Yes, I can absolutely give that assurance. I met with the FSB and then also I've met separately with the Chambers of Commerce for a very good and positive discussion. I think it's worthwhile putting on the record that neither of those organisations saw a conflict between business growth, economic growth, and of course the environment and their duties towards the environment, which I find very, very positive. Um, I think Glasgow's um, looking again, of course, as, as uh, the, the report is going through its various stages and committees, uh, seeing perhaps where they can be ambitious as they should be, but equally making sure they don't do damage inadvertently through unintended consequences. And I know the Conservatives at Glasgow City Council have also been, alongside all the other political parties, supportive of the principle of LEZs, and I hope that cross-party consensus continues. James Kelly. Thank you. Uh, one of the requirements in order to achieve the low emission zone is to ensure that all buses are fitted, uh, are retrofitted to be low emission compliant. There are over 3,000 buses that will need to meet this requirement. Can the, mon can the Minister detail uh, the, the timescales and associated costs uh, with that work? And is he, is he confident it can be met by the end of 2018? Hamza, yes, sir. Uh, to give you an idea of, of Glasgow's uh, um, plans, I would uh, suggest James Kelly it looks at the draft report that's uh, available. Uh, they don't suggest that 100% of <coughs> buses would be Euro 6 compliant by the end of 2018. They're doing what all low emission zones do, uh, having a lead in time, which includes some phasing. So I think by the end of 2018, if my memory serves me correctly, it would be about 20% by the end of 2019, 40% of buses and so on and so forth. Now, now, some have come back, such as Friends of the Earth, and, and, and requested that Glasgow City Council be more ambitious, I think. Uh, it's worth listening uh, to, of course, that call to be as ambitious as possible. Uh, we will provide the support and the funding, uh, and we've said that in terms of the 10.8 million we're bringing forward, a significant proportion of that will be for bus retrofit and abatement. So we'll do what we can from a government perspective. It's right that local authorities give the detail and, and, and what is practically and pragmatically possible while also being a, as ambitious as possible. But I'd refer James Kelly to Glasgow City Council's report and of course feed to them direct. Christina McKelvey. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Given that the poor, the sick, our children and the old are most at risk from the health con consequences of air pollution in Glasgow and our other post-industrial built-up areas, like areas in my constituency of Hamilton, Lack, Collins, Stonehouse and across other parts of Lanarkshire, does the Minister agree with the British Heart Foundation when it says now is the time for everyone to come together to implement workable and effective solutions to this problem? Hamza Youssef. Uh, yes, I, I wholeheartedly agree with the British uh, Heart Foundation that now is the time for everyone to come together to, to implement workable uh, and effective solutions to the problem. Uh, they, of course, as the member will probably know, join the Clean Air for Scotland group. The British Heart Foundation bring valuable research and also campaigning experience to the group. And we've already committed to introducing LEZs into the four largest cities. But we've also established routes uh, for, of course, uh, them to be rolled out to other air quality management areas uh, in the time after that. So, yes, absolutely, the time to prepare for LEZs uh, is now, and I'm delighted that the British Heart Foundation are bringing their valuable experience to the table. Question number six, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether its interpretation of the Ramsar Convention gives wildlife at wetland sites less protection than it is provided in the rest of the... Uh, sorry, by the UK Government. Rosanna Cunningham. Ramsar sites in Scotland are given legal protection through co-designation as special areas of conservation, special protection areas or sites of special scientific interest. That is the legal position as I set out in my answer of 21st February. Further to that answer, I can clarify and confirm that it continues to be Scottish Government policy to apply the same level of protection for Ramsar sites as that afforded to designate, designated Natura sites which provides Ramsar sites in Scotland the same level of protection as Ramsar sites throughout the rest of the UK. I thank the Cabinet Secretary... Claudia Beamish. Sorry, my apologies. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And uh, uh, given that the Scottish Government has committed to applying this welcome level of protection, um, could the Cabinet Secretary perhaps tell us how um, she would expect this will affect planning authorities' consideration of planning proposals that affect Ramsar sites and SNH advice to planning authorities regarding these in view of um, this, um, this acknowledgement. Rosanna Cunningham. Um, well, I need to be careful not to stray uh, too much into um, the planning side of uh, things. 
Um, there's been no divergence in policy, um, um, and the policy um, is expressed in Scottish Planning Policy uh, SPP in 2010. Um, uh, it is there, um, it reflects the legal position, um, and we're uh, not aware of any issues having been raised by NGOs at the time SPP was published. So nothing has changed uh, uh, since that uh, was the case. So it does remain our policy that Ramsar sites in Scotland uh, are treated as though they are Natura 2000 sites. Um, and I can confirm that SNH is aware of long-standing Scottish Government uh, policy, as well as the legal position in relation to Ramsar sites in Scotland. I ought to add, presiding officer, that government policy has not changed since the answer given to a parliamentary question in 2004 by the then Minister Lewis MacDonald. Question number seven, Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to ensure the long-term protection of the marine environment in light of reports that humpback whales are returning to Scottish waters. Rosanna Cunningham. The, this shows that our robust approach to environmental management is working, which is delivered through marine planning, licensing and direct conservation action. Current conservation actions include progressing towards a well-managed network of marine protected areas, which already covers 20% of our seas, improving protection given to vulnerable marine systems, ecosystems, and evaluating options for creating a deep sea marine reserve. Ivan McKee. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Dolphins and porpoises are also regularly seen in our coastal waters. Could the Cabinet Secretary also provide an update on the Scottish Government's work to conserve these charismatic species? Rosanna Cunningham. A dolphin and porpoise conservation strategy is uh, currently being developed to ensure that threats and pressures uh, to these species are being addressed across UK waters. A two-day stakeholder workshop is being held in Edinburgh uh, tomorrow and the day after, as it happens, to inform its development. Uh, a public consultation on the strategy uh, is intended to begin before the end of the year with implementation expected to begin during 2019. That strategy is part of our long-term commitment to meet national and international conservation standards, not just for marine mammals, but for the wider marine environment also. So regardless of our future relationship with the EU, the Scottish Government is committed to maintaining protection of the environment to robust international standards where we have devolved responsibility. And we hope and expect that the UK Government intends to do the same. Short supplementary, Finlay Carson. Given the Cabinet Secretary's responsibility for our marine environment, can she outlay any discussions she's had with Marine Scotland with regards to what data is being recorded and how it's being collected in relation to the environmental impact of electrofishing trials being carried out in Scotland? Rosanna Cunningham. The electrofishing trials that uh, the member refers to um, are, uh, uh, are a particular policy being uh, uh, carried through um, in the rural economy portfolio. Um, and I will ask uh, Fergus Ewing uh, to respond to uh, the member in more detail. I can say, however, uh, that both uh, Fergus Ewing and myself uh, have uh, constant uh, conversations uh, in respect of uh, uh, issues such as that, including data management, uh, and those conversations will, will continue uh, to ensure that we have the best uh, possible knowledge base uh, to uh, direct future policy in this area. Short supplementary, Neil Finlay. Um, what plans does the government have for um, managing activities uh, most likely to impact on uh, whale and marine mammal uh, recovery? Things like um, the, uh, the more unregulated uh, boat tourism. Rosanna Cunningham. Um, I think the member would need to give me some very specific information about uh, uh, if there are particular issues and related to marine tourism. Marine tourism, of course, is a very important part of uh, the rural tourism offers uh, in Scotland. I have not been made aware at any point of there being difficulties, although I do understand there is an emerging concern about potential disturbance. Uh, and if the member is happy, I will ensure that uh, um, he gets a more detailed update uh, on the specific issue uh, of potential disturbance, although there have been no very uh, specific concerns raised directly with me. Question number eight was not lodged. Question number nine was withdrawn. And if we're quick about it, we can do question number 10, Johan Lamont. 
the speediest I can, Deputy Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what animal welfare policies it has regarding pets or rough sleepers. Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, well, of course, we take the welfare of all animals seriously and we are committed to policies that improve the health and welfare of animals in Scotland. There are, however, no specific animal welfare policies regarding the pets of rough sleepers. All owners of animals are responsible under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006 to ensure the welfare of those animals in their control. Uh, we don't for one single minute uh, suggest that rough sleepers do not provide their pet with the best care they're able to provide. Indeed, there is no information uh, that that uh, is an issue. Uh, we are, however, uh, aware that there is good work being done, including veterinary assistance provided uh, by such as the Dogs Trust, PDSA, Street Vet, and all for pause. Joanne Lamont. Thank the, the Minister for that response. And indeed, I think there is uh, clear evidence that very often rough sleepers are particularly kind to their pets. But in Scotland, there are only three hostels which accept pets, and they are all in Edinburgh. And many homeless people across Scotland may give up the chance of shelter for the night if it means leaving the pets alone. I wonder if the Minister acknowledges the importance of this issue to a particularly vulnerable group of people and will she confirm whether she will consider how access to accommodation for homeless people with, who own pets will be expanded? Rosanna Cunningham. Um, well, I think as the member knows, that is probably more a question for the Housing Minister. I, I can, however, um, say that uh, um, uh, I, would be, I would have to have not been reading anything in the press not to be aware uh, of wider uh, concerns and indeed when I visited uh, homes or sanctuaries myself I, I see pets, dogs and cats there because people have um, changed tenure uh, or uh, moved from one landlord to another and cannot take animals uh, with them and that would be a particular concern in respect of uh, those who are homeless. We do have a code of guidance on homeless uh, which does recommend that as a matter of good practice a local authority should consider providing assistance with the kenneling of any pets if an applicant is not able to keep them in their temporary accommodation. There is a pet fostering service in Scotland um, and uh, for those who are not aware about it, there is a, a website that they can uh, go and uh, uh, get information about that particular service. Um, uh, the member may be uh, at least satisfied that I have already raised this issue directly with Kevin Stewart when I saw her uh, um, question. Um, and I just want to also note that I've raised uh, uh, Claudia Beamish's pause clause campaign uh, with the Housing Minister as well. That concludes questions on environment, climate change and land reform. And we will move on to the portfolio for rural economy and connectivity. Question number one, Daniel Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made on reinstating passenger services on the Edinburgh South Suburban Railway Line. Uh, there are, Yusuf. are no current plans to reintroduce passenger services on the Edinburgh South Suburban Line. The Scottish Government will be supporting development work being carried out by Network Rail to consider the electrification of the Edinburgh Suburban Line as it will provide, of course, an electrified route for freight services, thus enabling them to be removed from Waverley Station, as well as providing a diversionary route for cross-border and local passenger services should issues arise at the, at the station. Daniel Johnson. I thank the Minister for that answer. The last time this was looked at formally, it was such a long time ago that Tavish Scott was actually the Minister uh, responsible. So is it not now time, given that we now have trams in Edinburgh, given the concerns about raising, uh, rising traffic, and indeed that the, the line is going to be electrified, to, to bring forward a proper feasibility study into this uh, scheme? And indeed, would the Minister agree to convene a meeting with key stakeholders such as Network Rail, Scott Rail, City of Edinburgh Council and indeed Transport Scotland to look at how such a feasibility study could be brought forward after Tavish Scott's excellent previous work? <laughs> Hamza Yusuf. I'm sure like, uh, like any Transport Minister, Tavish Scott, probably after seeing the beast from the East, is probably happy he's not Transport Minister uh, any longer. But uh, enough of the utopian days of Tavish Scott as, uh, as, uh, as Transport Minister. And to, to, to answer the question uh, directly, what I would say to the member is, he's right, it's been, actually 2008 was the last time it was in the STPR, but of course it wasn't considered for further, uh, taking further because the business case was deemed to be poor and the city council at the time, and also Sestrans at the time, the, the regional transport partnership were happy uh, with that recommendation. When it comes to the development of uh, new rail lines, of course, uh, enhancing rail lines, 
uh, enhancing signal, uh, additional rolling stock uh, that would be needed for this. A business case has to, of course, be put together for that. Uh, what I would say to the member is we have, of course, uh, with our budget, uh, recent budget that's been passed, uh, put forward a £2 million uh, rail development fund. Uh, he may wish to look at uh, the details uh, of that. Uh, it would be really for the member and for the interested parties to come together to put together that business case to present for the next control period, which is 2019 to 2024. So we're not close-minded uh, to projects. Uh, if there is new information, then he and the other partners and stakeholders should put that together, uh, and there are appropriate funds uh, to help with the feasibility of that. Minister, could you speed that answer train up a wee bit so as we can get through here? <laughs> Supplementary to Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Deputy Secretary Officer. Um, I think Daniel Johnson makes a very uh, valid point. The potential for tram trains on that line could really help ease congestion off the roads uh, as well as opportunities for freight. The previous uh, uh, Chief of ScotRail, Phil Vester, was very supportive of the idea of tram trains on that line. Uh, does he know what ScotRail's current position is on this? And to reiterate Mr Johnson's question, will he agree to meet with relevant stakeholders or will his department agree to meet with relevant stakeholders to try and progress this? Hamza Youssef. Yes, I should have said uh, that there's no problem, of course, with the Transport Scotland meeting uh, and, and guiding uh, those who are promoting particular rail lines uh, or indeed stations. Uh, and of course, we'd be continue to be happy to do that. Uh, I don't know the current position of, of the MD uh, of ScotRail, so I wouldn't like to put words in his mouth, but I suspect uh, it will be not too different to, to my own, which is that if there's a business case there, it would have to go through the appropriate process. Uh, it would have to, of course, uh, make sure that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Uh, and of course, as I say, there is a fund available for that feasibility. John Finney, supplementary. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Minister, I always hear you encourage groups to come forward to you with proposals about rail, but I never hear that in relation to road. Why will the Scottish Government not take the lead in rail as it does in road construction? Hamza Youssef. Well, I think we do. I mean, for example, when it comes to the Borders Railway, that's a great example of the government taking a uh, lead, working with local partners. But of course, there is a process uh, to go through. I don't think we always have to. Uh, I think there, there, there is, of course, uh, a lot more that we are willing to do on rail in the control period six. 2019 to 2024 provides opportunities not just for local authorities and RTPs to come forward but of course for the government to think of enhancements and of course if the member has any suggestions I'd be more than happy uh, to meet with them to explore those in more detail. Question number two has been withdrawn. Question number three James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government how it is suppo supporting the food and drink sector in developing and growing markets. Hamza Youssef. Uh, developing and growing markets at home and abroad is a key part of Ambition 2030, the National Food and Drink Strategy, by providing £4 million of funding towards targeting a new export, market, uh, new export markets through the Scotland Food and Drink Export Plan, and also developing a new UK market strategy uh, with Scotland Food and Drink to target more opportunities in Scotland and across the UK. Uh, the Rural Economy uh, Secretary also recently announced funding of 250000 to establish a new regional food fund. This fund will provide small grants to enable local producers to promote their food and drink products from throughout Scotland to grow sales and markets. This fund will be open to applications from May. James Dorn. Is the Minister aware that in a recent agreement between the UK Government and the Government in Hong Kong on areas of priority for future trade collaboration, there was no mention of food and drink? Does he share my concern about how one of Scotland's key sectors might then be affected by future trade deals after Brexit? And how does he feel that this can be addressed? Hamza Youssef. Well, I'm astounded uh, by that, but perhaps not altogether surprised. It would be worth putting in context that when it comes to food, Scottish food and drink, the importance of that industry is that it makes up a quarter, or in fact over a quarter, 27% uh, of total food and drink exports from the UK, so hugely, hugely important. The fact that uh, a trade deal is being discussed uh, in a detailed stage, according to the UK government with Hong Kong, without food and drink, I think would worry every single one of us. Uh, I'm used to the UK government treating Scotland as an afterthought, but it seems like in this case, we're not even that. Supplementary, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Minister agree that at the time the, the food and drink sector has grown, it remains a scandal that, that so many children in Scotland still go to bed hungry at night, and one of the fastest growing sectors is food banks desperately trying to keep up with increasing demand? Does the Minister agree that the forthcoming Good Food Nations Bill should be used to enshrine in law the right to food, paving the way for action to end the national shame of food poverty in Scotland? 
Hamza Youssef. But where we have absolute agreement, undoubtedly, of course, is, is the shame of food banks. And I think most members across this chamber would have uh, visited their local food bank, and all of us would have said the same thing, that they're providing a great service, but all of us wish they weren't here and didn't exist. And there's no doubt, of course, that anybody we speak to at the food banks will tell you that austerity is one of the driving causes uh, of people having to come to visit food banks. In terms of the detail uh, of what he suggests, may I Said, said, uh, give that uh, suggestion back to the most appropriate minister and make sure that uh, he gets written detail of our plans moving forward. Question number four, Neil Finlay. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve rural bus services. Hamza Youssef. The Scottish Government is committed to improving rural bus services in Scotland. The Scottish Government is providing funding to the bus industry of over 250 million in the current financial year to support the overall bus network, maintaining, uh, maintaining routes uh, that would otherwise not be viable uh, to help passengers with the cost of fares, including, of course, concessionary fares uh, and support for local authorities to run services that they, that they deem socially necessary, but perhaps not commercially viable. The forthcoming transport bill will give local authorities the flexibility to pursue partnership working, local franchising, or indeed running their own bus services allowing them to better respond to local needs. Neil Finlay. Uh, thanks for that uh, drafted answer by a civil servant. Can I ask the Minister, um, across uh, the country we see rising fares, routes being cut and communities left isolated and frustrated. So, can I ask the Minister, are services improving or are they getting worse? Hamza, you said. Of course, it's a mixed picture. Lothian buses, for example, patronage has increased in other areas, patronage has declined, but it's why I'm bringing forward the transport bill. But let me just remind Neil Finlay that Labour may well talk the talk, but it is the SNP Scottish Government that walk the walk. In 13 years in Westminster in power, and eight years in Holyrood, of course, they never regulated the buses. They never brought in franchising, but the SNP will. They never allowed for municipally owned bus companies, but the SNP uh, well, so Neil Finlay should very much stick to doing what he does best, which is bluff, bluster, and making jokes that only he laughs at, and I'll stick to my day job, and I'm sure everybody will be happier for it. Here, here. <laughs> uh, supplementary, Tom Arthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In my own constituency of Renfrewshire South, there are communities such as Loch Winnock, which have seen a decline in bus services over the last decade. And it is that tension between um, limited demand and um, the commercial um, imperatives of um, operators. Can I therefore ask the Minister if he can outline how the upcoming Transport Bill can provide an important opportunity for the whole sector to improve bus services and to tackle declining patronage? Hamza Youssef. Well, the Transport Bill will bring forward a, a range of measures, of course, and, and uh, some of those I've outlined in my previous answer. It has partnership, uh, local franchising, uh, potential for municipally owned bus companies, more open data, uh, smart ticketing. All of these will uh, undoubtedly help. None of them are the silver bullet, and it should see local action will also be needed. So Glasgow, for example, uh, have a connectivity commission headed by uh, David Begg, which is looking at things like on-street car parking, bus priority lanes, etc., etc. So a mixture of national action uh, local action uh, is most certainly needed. Supplementary, Peter Chapman. Hi, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Aberdeenshire Council, of course in my region, have to subsidise 64 out of 123 routes, many of which are in, in rural areas. Now, last month they announced proposals to remove eight of these routes and reduce two. And now, with the council budget for this year decreasing by 4.36% in real terms, they had no, no other option. So how can the, the Cabinet Secretary continue to say that they are improving rural bus services? Hamza Youssef. Well, I'm not convinced that that's what I said at all. I said to my answer to Neil Finlay that there was a mixed picture across the country. In some areas, there's patronage decline. In some areas, there's an increase in patronage at borders. Buses uh, recently uh, uh, created, of course, as an example of a rural area where the bus, uh, bus market is doing better than it was uh, previously. So there is a mixed uh, bag. What I would say is the measures we're bringing forward in the transport bill will give local authorities more powers in order uh, to improve bus services, be they rural uh, or indeed urban. I look forward, hopefully, from what Peter Chapman has said to the Conservatives supporting that bill. Question number five, Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. As a member for a constituency where there are a large number of 
um, people whose families still live as far uh, as Excuse me, Mr. Kidd, could I Scottish ask you government? to ask the question yeah, that just, you submitted? Yes, no problem at Thank all, you. just in case it sounded weird. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is providing to farmers and crofters who face adverse financial circumstances following the recent extreme weather. Hamza Youssef. Um, th there's no doubt that the pr prolonged adverse uh, weather experienced uh, since last summer has had significant impact on farmers uh, and indeed crofters in different parts uh, of the country. Acknowledging that, uh, we set up the weather panel uh, last autumn as an effective platform for rapidly sharing information, promoting best practice and encouraging cooperation across farming and crofting sectors to address both the short and long term issues. I'm uh, delighted that today an uh, announcement took place uh, of a package of measures to support farmers, including £250,000 for fallen stock. Uh, and we are taking steps to open discussions with the industry to explore how we can address shortages with feed and fodder. We're also conscious that we need to build greater resilience uh, and collaborative solutions across the sector, which enable farmers and crofters to work together to, to get through short term situations. Uh, that will be a key focus for the weather plan uh, panel in the next few months. Bill Kidd. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for that reply. Can I ask, on top of what um, that interesting reply uh, contained, the personal aspects of farmers and crofters, what progress has been made to deliver the LFASS loans to hill and upland farmers and crofters who are likely to be feeling the financial impacts of recent weather the most? And while the financial impacts are fairly obvious, less visible with toll of the weather and pressure they're having on farmers and crofters' well-being and especially their mental health. Hamza Youssef. Uh, it's a good point. In terms of the LFAS uh, loan, uh, I'll say that uh, the LFAS 2017 loan offers uh, worth 57.4 million have gone out to 10,828 uh, farmers and crofters, uh, or 97 per cent of those that we'd expect to be eligible for LFAS payments. We're offering 90 per cent of their estimated final payment as a loan, uh, and so far processed 44.8 million of loan payments to 7,200 and 90 farmers and crofters. In terms of the, the, the latter point, the second point that Bill Kidd makes, I think it's a very, very good one. And I heard Fergus Ewing speaking on it uh, well on, on, on the radio. It's been welcomed by the NFUS, which is the financial donation to, to RSABI to help them provide more vital and practical and indeed emotional support for those who work in the agricultural sector, for those uh, that might not be uh, so aware of it. Of course, farming can be a very lonely uh, livelihood uh, and, of course, the long winter uh, that we've had uh, can exacerbate, can increase unfortunate mental health issues uh, and, therefore, the additional support and additional financial uh, assistance to RSAIB uh, uh, is one that has been welcomed. Question number six, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. To remind Chamber, I am the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs and what was discussed. Hamza Youssef. On March 26, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy and Connectivity met with George Eustace, the Minister for State for Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, as part of a series of regular ministerial meetings between the UK Government and devolved administrations. Uh, Leslie Griffith, Welsh Government Cabinet Secretary for Energy Planning and Rural Affairs and officials from Northern Ireland's Executive were also in attendance. The main items discussed were the European Council meeting on the 22nd and 23rd of March, the European Government's proposed fisheries bill, environmental ambitions, frameworks and funding. Emma Harper. Thank the Minister for that response. I'm interested to hear about any welfare issues that might have been discussed because um, the Minister might be aware of various Take the Lead campaigns, including those sponsored by SNH and the Scottish Farmer, which all aim to promote responsible dog ownership to protect the welfare of animals, including sheep, when people access the countryside with dogs so as not to worry livestock, wildlife and sheep. So can the, Cabinet Secretary, or can the Minister outline what action the Scottish Government has taken to tackle sheep worrying, mutilation and deaths caused by the uncontrolled dogs in South Scotland as well as other Scottish farmers? Hamza Youssef. I can say this important welfare issue is one that the Scottish Government takes seriously and it's one that I know Emma Harper uh, has been campaigning and championing uh, for a, a while and I want to say that the Scottish Government fully supports all steps taken to protect sheep from out of control dogs. The consequences of sheep worrying can be devastating all year round in particular obviously at the lambing uh, during the lambing season. The Scottish National Heritage Campaign taking the lead has our wholehearted support 
and emphasising why dog owners have to act responsibly in ensuring their dogs are kept under effective control in the countryside, including when near live, livestock. It may be helpful to confirm that Protection of Livestock Act 1953 criminalises any dog owner who allows their dog to worry sheep. In addition, local authorities could consider creating bylaw controls of dogs uh, that have been, has been an issue. Also, local authorities can issue dog control notices, including where an out-of-control dog is close to livestock under the control of Dog Scotland Act 2010. The Scottish Government always keeps laws under review and fully supports effective enforcement of the law in this area by justice agencies and local authorities. Supplementary, Tavish Scott. Thank you. Is the uh, Minister, well, I'm sure the Minister is aware that the NFU and uh, Circle Northlink today uh, asked Michael Gove, the Secretary of State for the Environment, to come to Aberdeen and see the transport system which uh, ensures livestock is uh, moved between the Northern Isles and uh, the Scottish mainland in a way which is entirely consistent with international regulations. Uh, would, he make sure, would his government make sure that uh, the UK government uh, do not do anything that stops that uh, taking place? And he might also want to reflect that that, was introduced, that system was introduced and paid for under a previous utopian regime. <laughs> uh, I, I knew I shouldn't have set that one up for him to volley uh, back uh, later on. But yes, I, I will. And actually, I'll take this offline uh, with Tavish Scott. I'm actually due to visit uh, Shetland and Orkney uh, myself later on uh, this month. Perhaps that's an issue I can engage on while I'm up there. And of course, I'll mention it to the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy, uh, uh, Rural Economy and Connectivity. I'm going to take question number seven, Liam Kerr. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when it plans to publish its proposals for agricultural support after the UK leaves the EU. Hamza Youssef. Uh, the Rural Economy Secretary set out key principles for this Government's vision for the future of farming and food production in a keynote speech at the NF NFUS AGM in February, uh, in which the twin roles of farmers as both food producers and custodians of the countryside were highlighted. I hope these are principles and an approach which the Scottish Tories will fully support and further that they will support this government in the Parliament's efforts to have all the powers over agricultural policy and funding transfer from Brussels to Scotland should we leave the EU, uh, that we need to realise a productive, sustainable future for Scottish farming and crofting. Liam Kerr. Thank the Minister for that answer. Given it is outlined in DEFRA's Health and Harmony document that the UK Government are to maintain the same cash total funding for the sector until 2022, a commitment which has been reiterated by Michael Gove, it seems to be the case that the Scottish Government's official line, and I quote, there is a lack of clarity from UK Government regarding the guarantee of funding, is redundant. Given that NFUS, Scottish Land and Estates and many others have put their plans on the table in light of these assurances, why has the Scottish Government failed to act? Um, say you, sir. Um, there is a lack of self-awareness sometimes from the Conservatives, which I find yeah, remarkable. It's a little bit like uh, the arsonist who asks about health and safety after he's burned in the entire village. Uh, and what I would say is that although the UK government have put forward uh, what they claim to be a policy, there is, of course, no detail at all on that. And to, to, to nick a Churchillian phrase, it's a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside uh, an enigma. So what I would say to Liam uh, Kerr is that, yes, we have a twin pond approach. We have, of course, our government champions. We have the National Council of Rural Advisors doing a heck of a lot of work on this agenda. Uh, we're waiting for their reports. It will be coming uh, soon. And of course, when that comes soon, uh, we will update Parliament. But may I welcome and end on a positive note, presiding officer, by welcoming Liam uh, Kerr's Damascene conversion that while the, his Tory colleagues are trying to use the courts to enforce their power grab over this Parliament, at least Liam Kerr believes that those powers should remain in Scotland and should remain in Scotland is something that he'll get full uh, support from the Scottish Government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Supplementary, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Given that the majority of UK-bound Elfast payments from the EU go to Scottish farmers, is the Minister aware of any plans by the UK Government to put in place a similar scheme post-Brexit and has an impact assessment on Elfast withdrawal from the Scottish agricultural sector been done? Hamza, uh, no, and of course the, the, the Cabinet Secretary has been asking time and time again for more detail uh, from the UK government. I can hear the Conservatives chuntering, uh, to miss, uh, and instead of chuntering yeah. from the sidelines, it'd be great if they could join the Scottish government in putting pressure on the UK yeah. government to yeah. give the reassurance to our farmers. Yeah. Yeah. This sector that is so needed and so vital to Scotland, give us that reassurance. And of course, uh, everybody around this chamber will be happy to give the Conservatives support and cajoling the UK government to actually give that reassurance to farmers who desperately need it. That concludes portfolio questions. Point of order, Mike Rumbles. Giving advance notice of this point of order, but the Attorney General has just said in the House of Commons 
that has been the practice since the Scottish Parliament was established in 1999, that every bill produced by the Scottish Executive and then the Scottish Government has been shared with the UK Government prior to publication. The Attorney General said that the purpose of this is to iron out any doubts that may exist about the competency of any bill. He then said that the Scottish Government's continuity bill, which is now before the Supreme Court because of a competency dispute, is the only bill, the only bill which was not shared in advance with the UK Government. <laughs> Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer, would you agree with me that this information should have been made available by the Scottish Government yeah. to this Parliament and we should not have heard about this through a question and answer session with the Attorney General in the House of Commons in, on TV this afternoon? Mr. Rumbles will understand that this is the first that I have heard of this, and I presume the first that anyone in this chamber has heard of this. Can I say to Mr. Rumbles that I am not responsible for relationships between governments, that would be the Scottish Government and the UK Government. What you've said has now been recorded, and I'm sure it will be looked at with interest from all parties involved. Point of order, Stuart Stevenson. Considering the previous point of order, presiding officer, will you also give thought uh, to members' bills, committee bills, private bills, which I understand are an essential part of this Parliament's proceedings, which are not routinely shared with the UK government in advance of their publication. And therefore, it may well be that in his statement to the House of Commons, uh, to, to the Parliament at Westminster, incomplete information has been provided, but I, but I say that as part of the consideration that you may choose to give to the point of order that preceded this one. I can sense a very interesting debate coming on here. And uh, again, I'm sure that everyone has listened to what Mr. Stevenson has had to say. I certainly have. And I'm also sure there'll be a lot of reading going on by a lot of people later on this afternoon.